There's a trade-off between peace and justice. Um, and this comes up all the time, but there's also the impunity issue. So the argument is if we don't punish these guys, they're going to do it again and again and again. And I live in, in Kenya, and they had this horrible election in 2007, 2008, where 1,000, 2,000 people were slaughtered. Nobody's been punished. There's another big election coming up. The issues are very controversial. So everybody's like, Jesus Christ, what's going to happen now? Nobody's been punished. What's, what's somebody going to take away from that? So th this idea of punishment and what is punishment, does it actually have to be um, you know, going to jail or being killed or can it be uh, atoning for your sins? In Uganda, you know, they have this, this ritual called the, the Mato Put or, or something like that where they take, so, so the way it works in, with this whole LRA issue, everybody but Kony and a few others can come out of the bush and say, I slaughtered thousands of people, I'm sorry, and they're free. They're not going to see the inside of a jail cell. That's the deal right now. Full amnesty for everybody. And this guy that was captured, it's not clear if he gave up or he was captured. It's, it's mysterious. Maybe he took a deal and, and he wasn't one of the ones indicted by the ICC. That's no accident that he was the one that they got. Um, but this idea of, you know, what do you do long term versus short term? Short term, it would be, be better not to have the ICC because that, that sustains these conflicts. I see it all the time. And they're doing it in Congo. They're indicting all these people left and right. And then these guys are never, ever going to come out of the bush. They don't want to go end up like Milosevic or Charles Taylor. That's very humiliating and terrifying to them. And they'll keep fighting and fighting and fighting. But in the long term, what do you do? Do you just ignore the demands of justice? What type of message does that send? It's very complicated. Um, the best would be if it were handled locally so there's a little flexibility and the government could get involved. And they were trying to do that with the ICC, but the ICC has its own problems. Sometimes, you know, Ocampo came across as a, as a celebrity himself, and it became about him and him sort of, you know, telling people what to do. And let's not forget, he's a white guy in, in black Africa, and 90% of the cases in the ICC are in Africa, and there's a real resentment growing. We see it in Kenya where there was clearly guilt, and nobody wants to cooperate with the ICC. They say this is a, a neo-colonial instrument for the white guys to find a new way to punish us. So it's very, very complicated. But your argument, the gist of it, is, is totally valid and has to be considered. At least four formal attempts at a negotiated solution before the warrants. So it wasn't like they hadn't tried to negotiate a peace deal with Coney. The second thing is, um, like Jeffrey was saying, it's actually really cool. So one of the biggest projects that we do at Invisible Children on the ground is trying to send messages into the LRA fighters um, who would get amnesty if they escaped, but escape and surrender is actually a very difficult thing. So this is a flyer that we made, um, that we designed, the UN distributed, I think we printed about 50,000 of these ones. It's a specific group of individuals that came out at one time, and right when someone comes out that gets amnesty, you take photos of them back home, you take photos of them smiling, and then you put these all over the place in the LRA affected areas with multiple languages and drawings of how other LRA members can defect. Because there's a misinformation campaign. Coney's yeah. telling his guys, if you defect, they will kill you. Mm -hmm. And they may kill your family, they may chop off your head. I don't know what he's telling them, but he's scaring people from giving up, when the truth is they all can give up, except him and like three or four other guys. Exactly, exactly. So the powerful brainwashing that you're having to overcome, and when you interview the defectees, they usually say it took about two, three, sometimes four instances of seeing a flyer, hearing a radio message, seeing something else before they get the courage to overcome the brainwashing and say, I'm gonna give this thing a try. Um, what, excuse me. So this is, this is one thing that we're gonna do now in the wake of Caesar Achellum's capture, which is huge, um, is distribute as many flyers as we can at the appropriate time with the appropriate sign-offs. It's not just a project that we do on our own by any means, but we contribute to it. Uh, to try to see if there can be a momentum now, you know, if, the, if the, you can build on this um, progress. Last comment is this. Um, at the end of the day, at the biggest picture, when the reason that we're pushing for Joseph Kony to be arrested and sent to the ICC, even though the United States is on the short list of countries that's not a signatory of the ICC, for another time, uh, it, it is I personally, as a, as a person, <laughs> I'm tired. Uh, it's been a long couple months. I personally am excited about the day when the world comes together and says, you know, the ICC has defined three crimes. War crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. They've actually put a legal definition to those. They've hammered that out in a courtroom. And they've said if any individual, in the ideal circumstance, the ICC is saying, if any individual on the planet commits one of those crimes, that's the line in the sand, and humanity says you cannot do that. And then there's a credible system 
where that person is, has to account for their crimes. Your evidence has to be captured. They have to give a case in front of an independent judiciary, et cetera, et cetera. That to me is so exciting because then there's a system of what do you do about guys like Joseph Kony. There's a system for how the world doesn't just, you know, a Western power that has the power to actually stop it doesn't just get to decide, you know, is that a bad person or not. They don't get to decide what they do about it, but it's an actual system. That's the long-term kind of vision that we're, we hope that if, the, if it goes well with Joseph Kony and the top commanders, that provides momentum then for that bigger system that I think the world needs. I don't think so. I mean, I think it started, like I say, it started with this kind of legitimate grievance that his ethnic group had been oppressed and he was standing up for his ethnic group. And there was, the, there was a history of that. But, you know, now there's no, there's no ideology. And unfortunately, it's part of this bigger trend where I see it across Africa. Um, that there's, these rebel groups are, are fragmenting and getting into smaller, more unruly units. And there's no real clear reason why they're fighting. And that makes it hard to get them out. Because, you know, back in the day, if there was a rebel group that wanted political power, you come up with a peace agreement and you say, we'll give you half the seats in the government. We'll give you this, we'll give you that. That's what happened with Sudan. And they stopped fighting. They wanted political power. They wanted to control territory. They wanted certain things. And they got them. And they stopped. But these other groups like in Congo or Somalia or, or the LRA, there's nothing they want. So that's, that's the problem. It's like, what does Kony get, you know, out of, out, you know, he gets not to be hunted. That's basically it. That's what they can argue. Um, I, I don't think, I, I think, um, it's now a self-sustaining thing. They're doing this to protect themselves. They kill and abduct kids because that's how they have resources to defend themselves. Kony has a very elaborate self-protection mechanism where this is why they can't get him. He's, he's in one place and then he has a big ring around him of, of guys you know, that maybe are a mile or two away. And then another ring of more guys that are five miles away. And then another ring of guys. So, what happens in all these skirmishes is the Ugandans find somebody. They find a broken twig. When I was with them, they, they had they told me about uh, a little piece of sugar cane that had been chewed up and spat out in an area where there is no sugar cane. And that was a clue that these guys had just passed. And then they're hot on their trail. And the Ugandan soldiers are tough, too. I mean, it's, it's like an equal fight out there. And they find the group, and they start shooting. And one of Kony's, you know, little low-ranking guards will start shooting back. Everybody will flee. Kony will hear. He's gone. They never get close to Kony. They may kill or capture one of his you know, little guys, and then these women and children often escape. And they get very good information and intelligence. They interview him. Where were you guys? You know, where was he going? What was the next message? Something else I left out is he doesn't, he used to use satellite phones and, uh, and radios. They don't, they don't use that anymore. They're, these guys are like, they're evolving. And, and that's what makes them so hard to catch. And it, it's interesting too. I mean, because that's again feeding that need to be negative because slacktivists, the people who feel they did something great by just hitting share, are people who weren't doing anything. Mm -hmm. The activists and the people doing stuff are going to do more and are getting motivated. And it, it's just still finding a way to find the negative. And, you know. Can I just add one last thought? When we think about, you know, because getting 80,000 people to sleep in the streets, it's, that's uncommon, right? Um, people always ask us, how do you do that? And, and we say, you have to make it purposeful. You know, we don't, we try not to do any events or any campaigns that are just fluffy, you know, that are just meant to do it so that there's something to do, you know? And I think if, if you're able to have authentic purpose, you do it with them, you do it together, uh, because you believe in it, if it truly is purposeful, I think that's the best way that we've seen that you can actually motivate people to take real sacrificial action. Join us is what you yeah. do. You do it and they come and join you versus go out and do this because you're horrible unless you do this. I went on this trip in 1990 that Dan had led and I was just, I had grown up in a suburb of Chicago and I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, and then my life just took a left turn. It, it exposed me to Africa. I went back to college. I studied Swahili. I was just all into working in East Africa. And this was before I had any interest in being a journalist. And I had taken a creative writing class my senior year in college, and I had a professor that said to me, hey, maybe you should think of being a journalist or working for a newspaper. And I thought that was the dumbest idea I had ever heard because I thought it's boring and I, why do I want to do that? So, um, so that was like a real formative experience for me, was going on this trip in 1990, and, and, that, and who knows what I would be doing if I hadn't done that. And again, it's getting out there and getting in it.
you know, you, you can't really do it from here just thinking about it. At the same time, there was some reason you went to Africa in the first place, you know? I mean, you could have gone and it was horrible, but, and, and Dan obviously is this extraordinary figure that makes everything seem possible, I'm sure, and you're like, wow, this is cool. Um, but somehow also in your life, something got you there, the way something got Dan's parents there.